Welcome to the Elite Real Estate Leaders Podcast, brought to you by Trailstone Insurance Group, bringing you interviews with the best real estate and mortgage professionals, empowering you to understand the current trends in the housing market so that you make the American dream your reality. Enjoy today's episode. The Elite Real Estate Leaders Podcast. Today, we have with us Brian Wilbur, who's the co-founder of Bingo Reverse Mortgage. Brian, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me on today. Hey, you're welcome. And I know that reverse mortgages is a topic we can spend about uh, nine and a half hours on and still be scratching the surface. So we want to you know, learn from your years of experience. But before we dive in uh, to that, give us a little bit of your story and background and how did you get into the industry? Yeah, sure. So I I uh, grew up uh, ready to do reverse mortgages right out of the womb. So you know, <laughs> this isn't necessarily something you uh, you necessarily forecast in your life being a part of. But I, I was fortunate enough to uh, spend a little time in the Marine Corps native here out in Colorado and came back and got involved in the insurance industry originally. That's how I got first exposed. And through the years, um, I did a few different things for a few different um, companies working in spaces, both in the insurance space as well as in the financial services space, but ultimately got out of it and did some work with some different builders and developers. And then what I realized was after doing a little bit of research, uh, reverse mortgages are so misunderstood and they are such a pivotal piece of the upcoming retirement uh, crisis that we have facing us. Um, and I was originally exposed to that by my father-in-law. And so anyway, I discovered reverse mortgages, began to learn about and became kind of interested in them with 10,000 seniors uh, turning 62 every day. It's, it seemed like an opportunity. What I discovered though, Mike and Tia, is uh, my family actually was impacted. Their estate was impacted by a reverse mortgage and allowed them to do so many things with me as a grandchild, with my grandparents that I wasn't even aware of. It. Through that process, I really discovered how this product um, could make an impact and I've become a student of it and I have a passion for it. So that's kind of my background, our start out here. Awesome. I, I love when you can hear um, personal experience like, oh, I had this or I noticed this or this was a problem and there was no solution. So I you know, uh, dedicated myself to figuring it out. So let's just dive right in. And uh, I think a, a great place to start is define what what is a reverse mortgage because i think that a lot of times people might have a wrong misconception so let's define it and then talk a little bit about how people are using them like you were saying financial planning or just different different ways that they can do that sure absolutely well first of all a reverse mortgage it's reverse mortgage is actually just a nickname uh for for this product the actual term for this product is a home equity conversion mortgage or the acronym hmm. HECA. All right. So the reverse mortgage is the popular term that we're all used to hearing for better or for worse. Now, anything that's kind of been around since 1961, you know, it's probably got um, a little bit of history, maybe even a little baggage with it. So it's been through a lot of iterations through the years, a lot like um, a colleague of mine makes the analogy about a cell phone. You know, remember your first cell phone? Back in the day, um, big yep. bulky, and through the years, it was yeah. in a, it was in a, mine was in a bag with a zipper, and then I upgraded to having it hardwired into my car. <laughs> yeah, oh, you, okay, okay, you weren't messing around, and so it's just <laughs> right. from, from a posture standpoint, simply making a phone call, you can see all the different iterations through the years and how the product has improved. A reverse mortgage is very similar to that. It's been through very. Uh, various changes, various regulations uh, through the years. Um, I'm not typically one to advocate for a tremendous amount of uh, government regulations, but I can tell you that this space um, is the most highly regulated financial service product that I'm aware of. And I'm talking about any type of portfolio products out there. And the reason is because we're not only dealing with regulations that were put in place after 08 got hurt when this product originally came out. So changes were made to protect both the client as well as the investor. And then changes were also made in 08 to the lending process in general. But on top of that, this is a protected class. Yeah, Seniors are really the treasure 
of our community and the backbone. And because of that, um, there are laws to protect, and this is highly, highly looked over. And it's a place where I, I feel very comfortable understanding where we can bring value. And I also feel comfortable saying that the product is not for everyone. So a reverse mortgage is really nothing more than a mortgage. It's just a and, mortgage. And isn't it kind of like the name implies reverse? So like in a regular mortgage, when you make payments, it slowly but surely goes down. But in a reverse mortgage, you're getting money out of your house and the balance of the mortgage slowly but surely goes up. Well, you just you just did my job right there. You just <laughs> talk about as clearly as you can. You pay a traditional mortgage payment with a reverse mortgage, it pays you and that negatively accruing balance goes up. That's correct. Yeah. That's exactly how it works. There's a couple, you know, and I think, it, but that is I think exactly. that a lot of people feel like, yeah, but you're sucking out the equity. And well, like you've already said, and we'll get into it in a little bit, but it's not for everybody. It's not the solution for every person out there, but in a situation where maybe there's uh, this husband and wife that just don't have two nickels to rub together. So they're house rich, but cash poor. Maybe in that case, it's like, well, you, you it's fine to eat up some of that equity because now it's giving you the quality of life you need right now. That is definitely one scenario uh, that we see in an overwhelming majority of reverse mortgages are for uh, situations like you just outlined. Here's a common a common scenario I like to share with people when I teach these classes for real estate agents and ad advisors as well. We have three different clients that we typically see. One's grandma and grandpa, and they've done well. They've had a very good life, but they're in their end of their years typically grandma outlives grandpa and he passes away she loses his pension mm -hmm. um as well as uh his social security not to mention her husband and uh mm -hmm. like that mate oftentimes right and what we often see in his grandma then owns the home and can't afford to really go do much with grandkids or uh, go do movie night because she's just like you said house rich and cash poor so we can come in and make an impact where she can either set up term payments or a lump sum or some type of revenue stream coming in in a way that allows her to make sure she has enough money to be comfortable and cover her needs, maybe even improve the quality of your life a little bit, right? So that's the typical scenario that we see. We also have clients who are simply trying to manage tax brackets. You know, we've sure. got client, you know, well, let me give you a quick example here. Um, and this is not nearly as common, but Typically, when you have clients that have, and let me give you a more common scenario, would be like a Roth IRA conversion. When you get into retirement age, you start thinking, obviously, about a lot of different things, but longevity risk is the most important. Are you going to outlive your money? That's the most important thing you're thinking about when it comes to those retirement years. Reverse mortgages have been studied by Texas Tech and MIT and Cambridge University. Um, they've run the 10 year models out and even FINRA, the financial and uh, financial advisors and insurance, the national regulatory agency, FINRA changed their position on them in 2013 because reverse mortgages are actually a fantastic way in some situations to hedge against inflation, preserve a portfolio. And like I said, do those Roth IRA conversions, pay that tax on that conversion and allow that money to grow tax-free in a Roth. Now, if you don't understand what a Roth is, you're probably a little younger like I am, but essentially everybody's trying to move their money into tax-free uh, a bucket, right? And yep. the tax components of a reverse mortgage, especially the growing line of credit, I'll say that again, especially the growing line of credit that's available, the tax components are not insignificant. So to answer your question, we do help people that are definitely struggling and need a little extra income and have a little breathing room. Uh, but we also help people manage tax brackets and, and keep more money in their pocket. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah, that, that was great. And I actually did have a quick question when you mentioned the spouse, the surviving spouse, yes. am I correct? Is, uh, and I might just not remember it well, so you might just have to refresh everybody, yeah. but does the spouse have to be the 62 years old if they're the surviving spouse or how does that how does that whole thing work oh, great great question here so back in 2013 is when this changed and this was one of the reasons why people got a little bit spooked about reverse mortgages so the way it worked back in the day was 
only one person had to be on the deed. So if you had uh, mom and dad or a husband and wife who owned the home, and the way you're able to draw money out of a reverse mortgage is based on three things, interest rate, the equity and the value of the home. Okay. Uh-huh. And then um, the interest rate, the value of the home, and then the other component will come to me in a moment here. But once you calculate how much money you're able to get out, it's essentially because of the age of the oldest person. Back in the day, you didn't have to put both people on the deed uh-huh. or me on the note. So you'd use the older person's age oftentimes so they get more value. Well, what happened fast forward is dad would pass away and then the newspaper read Big Bad Bank kicks grandma out of house. Mm, right? yep. She wasn't on the note. So what they did is they changed the law. They do not have to be 62. Barring spouse protections, it's one of the biggest changes that were made. Um, and it's part of the reason why this product is so safe. So you do not need to be 62 or older to be the non-barring spouse. You just need to be over the age of 18. And should something happen and the other and the qualified borrowing spouse should pass away, that non-barring spouse has the right to live in that home, stay in that home and control all the equity until they make a decision to leave themselves. So big changes came in 2013. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. If I may, and let me know uh, what other questions you have. But some people think the bank owns your home or the government owns your home. And I can assure you the bank does not want to own your home. <laughs> the bank wants the mortgage payment paid. So yeah. when there's a moment of maturity where nobody's out living in the home anymore, all right, the estate or the heirs, right, typically the children, right, they remain in control of all the equity in the home. Now, whatever is owed on that balance needs to be paid just like any other mortgage. Um, but they have up to 12 months to decide the kids, do we want to keep this house? Do we want to keep mom and dad's house? Okay. How much of a mortgage is there on there? What do we need to do to come up with that balance? They can pull that money from anywhere or refinance it traditionally themselves. Do you guys want to know what the reality is 97% of the time? Yeah. They sell it. They sell the home. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would think. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and just to be clear too, Brian, isn't it true that when you do a reverse mortgage, the no one else is on the note or deed or, or title. It's just the mom and dad or husband and wife or whatever. There's no other entity on there. And then the lien holder is the bank. And then like you just said, if you want to refinance or sell, then you just need to get a payoff. What do we owe on this? And boom, you pay it off, whether it's refi or cash or sell. Just like any other mortgage. You're exactly yeah. right. Just yeah. like- but I think what we're going into, Brian, what if it sells for less? Yeah, great question. What if for some reason in Colorado, not as big a concern here, but let's say we we're in Missouri or Texas, right? And we had concerns about home value fluctuation. Um, we know in Colorado, we got pretty steady home belt, but let's say the home went upside down or let's just say more realistically, somebody opened it up at 62 uh, because that's slowly becoming the common wisdom is turn this on as soon as possible in a line of credit that grows and don't touch it unless you have to. That's another show we'll talk about sometime, but let's say you set it up at 62 and you took as much money as you could out and you did that for 30 years and now you're 92 and you pass away and your home's upside down in value and your estate and your kids inherit the home, right? Do they Uh owe the difference, right? That's the question. This is a non-recourse loan. And what that means is that no heirs or the estate would ever be responsible for the upside down value of the home. In fact, we haven't had it happen often, but I've had colleagues where they've said, Hey, we've inherited this home. There's a reverse mortgage and it's upside down. You know, it's a home up in the mountains and it's the market's just not there. And they've had it for many years. And what do we do? So how do we sell it? How do we do it? And why would you try to sell it? Just call up the bank, leave the keys under the mat, Go inside and do what most people do and they get their specials, the special things through the years they want from their family, but they can literally walk away from it because the heirs are never responsible for any upside down amount. All right. Wow. So not a common scenario that we see, but it's important to know that protection is there. It's one more way that this product is safer, protects the family. So you're absolutely dipping in to the um the estate that could be left behind to the heirs by tapping into some of the equity. But what you'll find is at the end of running the numbers, and when you look at the tax component, um, 
sometimes, not always, but sometimes it makes sense to use this as a buffer asset to preserve a larger portfolio elsewhere. So there's a lot of strategy involved. It's holistic. It's really kitchen table. Uh, you really need to sit down and talk. How are your other income in retirement structured? How are your life insurance and annuities and things like that structured? Um, what is your retirement income plan and how does this fit in? Does it even fit in at all? If it's a hand-built cabin, you want to pass on to the kids? Might not want to do this. However, if it's a home that you think is going to be liquidated at the end and you want to leave a nice nest egg or not nest egg, but you want to leave a nice uh, state to your children or to your heirs, rarely is real estate the most financially sound way to transfer that when you look at capital gains tax. So I uh, talk with the financial advisor. We often sit with an estate attorney as well, and it really is kitchen table. And how do you, you know, respond Brian, to people who, oh, sorry, Mike, yes. <laughs> we're probably have two very different questions going on, but I was going to say, yeah. um, how do you respond to people who are like, well, why couldn't I just pull out a HELOC for 80%? What would you, what would kind yeah. of be the that cost analysis really for those yeah, two yeah. scenarios? Well, first of all, that's a scenario we look at. Um, we have a responsibility on our end to make sure that we look at all the different options that are available. Um, and one of the reasons why, and one of the reasons why I do like, as I mentioned, being a piece of this space um, is because there's HUD counseling involved, uh, housing and urban development. Everyone that looks at a reverse mortgage takes the quote and sits down with that exact quote from their broker lender with a certified HUD counselor for about an hour, maybe a little more, a little less, depending on questions, where they go line by line and they go through every single, have you looked at a HELOC? Have you looked at a cash out refi? Have you looked at pulling from your IRA or your other qualified accounts? You know, Are there other scenarios that make sense? Why do you, what are you trying to achieve? And is there a net benefit for the client? So. Uh -huh. Not only do you have somebody on this end talking about whether it's a benefit or not, but you also have a third party. Um, I call them a Fed that uh, has their eye on it as well. It's just one more safe piece. But to answer your question is with a HELOC or any other type of loan, there are times where those are more benefit. However, with a HELOC, you always have a payment. Yep. With a HELOC, that can be canceled at any time. And I personally know people in 2008 who were relying on a substantial HELOC um, line of credit, and those can be turned off at any moment by the lenders. All yeah. right. On top of that, they're often for a certain amount of time, 10 years or whatnot. The benefits of a reverse mortgage is you could typically tap into a percentage of the equity of your home based on your age, interest rate, and value. But let's say, for example, you were able to tap into $250,000. The difference with a reverse mortgage line of credit specifically is that line of credit sits there just like a HELOC available, and it grows at the same rate as the loan. Can you, you guys have had a little experience in the financial services industry. Can you name another line of credit that you're aware of that grows? Uh, I would say no. Yeah, no. Nope. Closest thing would probably be an annuity. So there's a lot yeah. of pieces to this a lot of people don't understand. It's not a last resort, although it can be a fantastic way to come in and recover a situation that has been eroded by er uh, um, uh, inflation specifically. But it's also a tool for the middle class to manage their tax brackets and for the upper class to put themselves in a position where they can avoid drawing out of their qualified accounts and taking that financial hit. Let me give you an example. I'll give you one quick one, and, and this is not very common, but and I know these numbers might be staggering, but at the end of the day, it's just zeros on the ends of numbers. But I had a client, uh, or a colleague who got a client call, um, Northern California client. Uh, they got hit with a $7.2 million capital gains tax bill, and they called up. They owned a $10 million home outright, 100% paid off. They were qualified by age, and they asked my colleague, hey, can I pull out? $7 million out of my reverse mortgage, out of my home, and pay that capital gains bill. And he said, no, you cannot do that. What you can do, you qualify for around $4 million or so. Um, so he was able to take $4 million out of his reverse mortgage, doesn't have a payment on it, right? And so he's able to pay $4 million of the capital gains. He renegotiated payment terms on the rest 
of the balance to the IRS. And, you know, when you make that kind of money, they expect those payments pretty quickly. But this individual's only other option would have been to pull around $15 million out of his qualified wow. account in Northern California yep. to net $7.2 million. Oh. So this is an extreme case. We deal yep. with a lot more grandmas wanting to take the kids on a cruise or help with a down payment or things like that. But or this just is, put food on the table. Yeah, to put food yeah. on it. That's much more common, but this will be a mainstream product in 10 years. It's just, um, it's really the eighth wonder of the financial services world. So Brian, I know that for me, what little I know about reverse mortgages, I have heard that one of the misconceptions slash, you know, red flags is, oh, well, it's just got high fees. Yep. Clarify that for us. Yes. So the closing costs are higher, significantly higher on a reverse mortgage. And that's part of that kind of holistic sit down and does the end number make sense? But the reason it's so high is because of the MIP, mortgage insurance premium. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Yeah. MIP is 2%, which is not insignificant. We see closing costs sometimes $15,000, $20,000, right, which is very, very high. And that can be a some people. Now, when you look at what actually it costs to not do the reverse mortgage, that's a conversation that has to be had yeah. as well. But what's important to understand is in the net number is it's not out of pocket. Um, typically, the only out-of-pocket cost is appraisal and that HUD counseling, which is about 200 bucks. Um, and so all of those closing costs are rolled into the loan. Now, let's be clear, those are absolutely going to get paid at some point by somebody, whether it's the estate or whether it's the homeowner when they sell the home, downsize, upsize, relocate, whatever. All right. So those fees definitely don't go away, but they are rolled into the back end. But every time yeah. a mortgage payment is not made, that loan balance negatively accrues along the way. Now, there's mm -hmm. one other thing I need to mention, and I do want to be clear on this. There are four or five things you need to do with a reverse mortgage that's incredibly critical. And if you meet these five things, then the sailing should be very smooth. Number one, you have to pay your taxes. Okay. Yeah. Majority of people that got into trouble early on in the early 80s before Reagan brought it under the purview of the FHA is people didn't think they had to pay their taxes. Listen, if you don't pay your taxes on a forward mortgage, they're going to come knock on your door. So you got to pay your taxes. You have to insure the property. You got to keep it insured. You have to maintain it. Okay. Has to be your primary residence. That means you got to live there six months in a day. Okay. But you got to make sure that you pay those HOA fees as well. So HOA fees, taxes, insurance, very simple, but these are the details that people need to understand. Um, the same with a traditional mortgage. You're exactly right, Mike. You're yeah. exactly right, Mike. Yeah. So let's kind of wrap up with this, Brian. What do you see as the future of reverse mortgages in the overall financial landscape of mortgage lending and retirement planning? What are you seeing coming up in, in years to come? Well, the reality is, um, having been in the educational space uh, for real estate agents for some time now, is the reverse for porch for purchase, which we haven't even spoke about, that essentially allows people to uh, buy a home for about 60% down. So we're talking about cash buyers here. Instead of buying a home for 800,000, maybe you put $600,000 down, keep 200,000 in your pocket with no mortgage payment. That's going to become much more common. But what else is going to become common is this is going to be a conversation at, at the financial uh, advisor level. Um, there's enough education out there now to where fiduciary responsibilities are going to be kicking in and people need to understand and they can go do their own research. But at age 62, um, everyone, everyone should take a look at a reverse mortgage growing line of credit and try to eliminate it from their retirement plan. Yeah, that's my opinion. Well, I think it's neat to see that there's options out there, that there's opportunities to open up the hard-earned equity you've built up over the years. It's Is it right for every single person? Nope. But when it's right, it's it's available to really uh, give some of that peace of mind, like you were saying. So I think that is spectacular, Brian. If someone is listening and thinking, maybe I should check into this and learn more, how can they learn more and then also reach out and connect with you? Absolutely. One of the easiest ways attend one of our CE classes. Um, we got one coming up Tuesday, September 10th from 10 a.m. to 1.30.
uh, hosted by First Integrity Title in Cherry Creek. And you can find more details and talk to me or reach out to our amazing team at bingoreversemortgage.com. Excellent, Brian. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Teal. Thanks, Brian. All right. Thank you for listening to the Elite Real Estate Leaders Podcast, brought to you by Trailstone Insurance Group. To learn more about the topics mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.elitereallestateleaders.com.